So in order to break down large molecules into smaller ones, you need things called enzymes. Enzymes are actually proteins that cells make. Uh, they are not only involved in breaking down molecules though, um, they actually, you actually need them for basically every chemical reaction that happens inside your body will be controlled by a specific enzyme. So enzymes are crucial for cells and for living organisms. Enzymes are what we call biological catalysts. What this means is that they speed up a reaction but don't get used up in the reaction themselves. They are, as I said, proteins, that's their structure, which are coded for by the genes inside the nucleus. And the function of enzymes, therefore, is to catalyze metabolic reactions. Now, the reason you need them and to catalyze metabolic reactions is because our body temperature is 37 degrees C. And this is actually, although it, you know, it's quite warm compared with some living organisms, it's not that warm for a chemical reaction, for the speed of a chemical reaction. You'd like reactions to happen at a higher temperature. Without enzymes, our bodies would probably just work too slowly, but enzymes can speed up the rate of all the reactions, and so our body temperature doesn't need to be kept any higher than 37 degrees C. So it, it really, really helps, so very, very important, crucial. Each enzyme in its structure, it has something called an active site. Now the molecule that it wants to help change is called the substrate, and the substrate and the active site need to fit together like a lock and a key. They will match in perfect shape. And as I said, you will need a particular enzyme to match a particular substrate. So you need a different enzyme for every reaction that happens inside the body. So the substrate and the enzyme bind together using the active site, and they form what we call an enzyme-substrate complex. The reaction then takes place, and in this case, that might be breaking something down, a large molecule into a small molecule, and the products get released. Now, when the products are released, you can see that the enzyme is therefore free to do the same again. So remember, it's a biological catalyst. It helps speed up the reaction, but it's not getting used up in the reaction itself. It can be reused over and over and over and over again. Enzymes will be affected by a couple of things. They're affected by temperature, and they're affected by pH. So a good example, if you're looking at temperature, is to look at the enzyme called amylase. Now, am amylase is an enzyme that's used to break down starch in your diet into smaller molecules like glucose. You can test for starch using iodine. So if we use iodine and test, test starch, uh, and it will go blue-black if uh, there is starch present, and then we add some amylase, we can see when the amylase has broken down all the starch because the reaction will stop going blue-black. So we know that the amylase has done its job and it's broken down the starch. We can then change the temperatures to see if that happens quicker or slower. So what you would do is you would get some starch in a test tube, a, a specific volume, maybe 10 mil um, of a particular concentration, and you'd have a similar volume, maybe 10 mil of amylase, again of a very specific concentration, predetermined concentration, and you would keep them in a separate boiling tube in a water bath for 10 minutes so that they get to the desired temperature that you want to investigate. Then after those 10 minutes are up, you mix them. Now the reaction will start at that point and um, the amylase will start breaking down the starch. Now you can't just add um, iodine solution into that test tube because once it's changed color, it doesn't keep changing color live as it were as the reaction is changing. So what we need to do is every 30 seconds take a small sample out of the test tube and test that with the iodine to see if it's still going blue-black. By the, if you keep doing that every 30 seconds, um, and when you are taking out samples and they're not going blue-black anymore, you know that the reaction is finished and the starch has been broken down by the amylase. All you've got to do then is repeat exactly the same procedure with the same volumes and same concentrations, but change the temperature of the water bath to see uh, what happens at a different temperature. Do a range of maybe seven or eight temperatures, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 degrees, um, and then uh, collect your results and plot them on a graph. Now, when you do that, you will find that uh, you, get, you should get this sort of shape. And this is the typical shape of what happens with an enzyme as you change the temperature. Now, as you change the temperature, the enzyme 
works better because it has more kinetic energy. The enzyme moves around more, it has more collisions with substrate molecules in a given amount of time, uh, and they're more successful, and it breaks down more of the, the substrate, and so the reaction increases. And it keeps getting quicker and quicker as you heat up the enzyme and give it more kinetic energy. However, there becomes a, an opt, uh, point where it's working at its optimum rate, which in this case is probably around 37 degrees C, as shown by this graph here. And after that, though, the rate suddenly very quickly decreases. And this is because the enzyme has become denatured. If you heat up the enzyme too much, then it just changes shape uh, and loses all its shape. And if the active site changes shape, the substrate won't fit anymore, the enzyme won't work anymore. The enzyme hasn't died, remember, the enzyme is not a living thing, it is a molecule, but it has now changed shape permanently, and it's what we call, uh, we say that it has been denatured. The effect of pH is sort of similar. pH, again, there is an optimum pH at which most enzymes work. It's usually around pH 7. Some enzymes, though, work really well at different pHs. For example, pepsin, which is an enzyme you have in your stomach, works really well in acidic conditions because that's what your stomach is. Uh, but again, if you go outside of that pH, maybe too acidic or too alkali, then that can change the bonding in the active site. The active site can change shape, starts to stop working, and it becomes denatured again, and therefore the reaction stops. So enzymes have this optimum temperature, an optimum pH at which they will work best. A nice practical that you could do for the uh, pH example would be to uh, use buffer solutions, which you can use to maintain a range of different pHs and then to investigate something called catalase. Now catalase is an enzyme that we have in our cells that breaks down hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a waste product of metabolism and it's very, very toxic, so it needs to be broken down. So you have catalase uh, in your cells, especially lots in your liver, in order to break down hydrogen peroxide. It breaks down hydrogen peroxide into water and uh, oxygen. So what we can do is we can actually measure the rate at which oxygen is given off um, when we use catalase to break down hydrogen peroxide. Now, all we've got to do is to therefore set up an experiment where you've got in a test tube the buffer solution of whatever pH you want, 2, 4, 7, 10 or 12, for example, some hydrogen peroxide, and then add some catalase. And then just got to collect uh, or count the number of bubbles that come off uh, in a minute and that gives you an indication of the rate of reaction. Do the same thing again, but change the pH buffer, use a different pH buffer. Uh, remember again to make sure that the control variables are kept the same to make it a, a valid experiment and to collect accurate results. Uh, in order to make an experiment more reliable, it's all about repeats. Do your experiment 10 times, it's much more reliable than if you did it once. In order to make it more accurate, then you need to maybe think about ac more accurate ways of collecting the dependent variable, which is the oxygen bubbles in this case. You might want to actually collect the volume uh, rather than just count the number of bubbles. Then we're going to get a more accurate result, which means closer to the true value.